So welcome to Dog Point's first podcast. Today we are in Maracas Valley, St. Joseph, and um, we are at the facility of Roger Barkley, a good, good friend of mine of close to 20 years. Yeah, I think um, so. He is the owner of from Royal Valley Kennels, um, Royal Valley ID Systems, he is the founder of the Universal Schutzen Club of Trinidad and Tobago and currently the club's PRO. He is the founder of the Federation of Canine Registration in Trinidad and Tobago as well as the chairman of RSB Global Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome, Roger. Thank you, Matt. I'm it's very nice happy to, to have you on our inaugural podcast. Um, it's an honor. I know you as i said for close to 20 years and um so it was important to me to have the first podcast with you because throughout um my time here um you have been instrumental in many things regarding development of training as well as um dogs one of the best dogs i ever had came from your kennel i was ninja um and countless times where you helped me out in terms of dogs and when I was stuck in some training issues and, and so forth you have always offered a perspective that made me feel like I've never trained a dog before and um, so that was great and um, today we want to get into a topic a little bit that um, I know is dear to your heart and that is breeding and genetics and um, for those who don't know, um, German Shepherds, Roger Barkley. <laughs> <laughs> a sing almost single-handedly brought back the breed from a very bad point at some point in history um, to a really good quality. So, Roger, first off, we, we said we're talking about genetics and breeding. And um, for our viewers, let's, we want to make it clear, we are not scientists. So we, we're not, we're not going to be, you know, looking at test tubes. We're looking at each other, talking about something that we observe, that we know. Right? So um, why is genetics so important in breeding? Let me throw that just out there as a starting point. Um, and yeah. Tell us a little bit something about yourself and then we dive into it straight. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, and, and Michael, of course, who is behind the scenes here um, doing all the technical work. Uh, thank you to you guys for, first of all, the good work that you're doing with the Dog Point uh, series. Um, I'm happy to be associated with uh, you guys and to be part of this inaugural uh, podcast. Um, it, it is indeed a pleasure, and I feel uh, honored. I, uh, all those accolades and so on. <laughs> uh, sometimes I wonder how those things happen, but it's uh, uh, an evolution for me uh, over many, many years. Um, and uh, it was, it has been a uh, a process of discovery. And uh, if I can speak, I, I want to first of all. Uh, reiterate uh, the position that we are not uh, in any way claiming to be scientists uh, in a lab uh, using test tubes and microscopes and what have you. However, uh, I can assure you that like many of our counterparts around the world, uh, in Europe and, and, and the US, South America, uh, through the, the, the process of having to train dogs, through the process of breeding dogs that we love, through the process of observing uh, which dogs fit, uh, fit for purpose, whether it be uh, as a pet, whether it be in high level dog sport, competition sport, uh, whether it be for police or military or paramilitary work, uh, search and rescue, um, dogs fit uh, are trained or, or, or are inclined a particular way 
and not every dog can do every task. Some dogs are more inclined one way or the next, and over the many years, for example, with the German Shepherd dog, uh, Captain Max von Stefanitz uh, was credited with having created the German Shepherd dog back in the 1890s, I think, uh, over 100 years ago. And he would have had a reason for doing that. Uh, the German Shepherd dog is considered a, a, a herder, herder type dog, and had to be able to manage many hundreds of heads of uh, whether it's sheep or cattle, and at the same time not hurt, harming them, but also being able to carry out the work that the farmer or the herder himself wanted. And that behavior requires a very unique set of skills and characteristics, and he uh, created a dog to do that, probably using several different breeds or dogs that were available, and eventually coming up with a dog that consistently displayed a certain type of behavior that looked a particular way, uh, behaved a particular way, and uh, was able to be trained easily for the particular job. So, so in other words, he really and truly doubled in genetics and didn't know it. <laughs> That's exactly what has happened. Right. And uh, he looked for traits that he saw in some dogs and used it again and again. And yes. So it's probably to create the, the yes. dog that he wanted. Correct. So it's sort of the long way around. Um, but this is what basically it is and has evolved in over many, many years across many, many breeds. Uh, so in the, in the world of uh, purebred dogs in particular, um, this you can see this happening all the time, and hence the reason why uh, worldwide some dogs are uh, known to be able to carry out certain tasks and perform certain duties more than other dogs. So while you may have a, a, an anomaly in that one breed that is not commonly uh, recognized to do a particular job, that might be able to do it. However, there are dogs that you know across this breed that this is more generally known to do that particular kind of tax. Right, so essentially, you know, slowly but truly creating all the attributes that he yes. wanted in a dog yes. to perform a specific task or multiple tasks, yes. right? Um, I think I heard you at some point saying the German Shepherd is not a specialist in anything but excellent in everything. Yes. And that's very true. I mean, you have guide dogs for the blind. You have... German Shepherds that herd sheep. You have um, search and rescue dogs. You have military dogs. You have police dogs. You have sport dogs. Yes. You know, um, so it's across the, the, the spectrum of, of work with dogs. You find the German Shepherd in everything. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, um, so, so I um, have come to love the German Shepherd as a breed. Uh, over many years. In my early days, I had um, different, <laughs> like most people who would have started out, uh, Dobermans or even mixed dogs. Uh, long ago, people used to cross dogs, you know, and have their mix. You had a Doberman and Ridgeback mix. Uh, you might have a Pitbull and something else mixed. Uh, but eventually, what happened to me is, is I, as I began to fall more and more in love with dogs, because my dad kept dogs and stuff like that, hunting dogs in particular for him. Uh, but I started to, I, I, I loved the Rottweiler. And then eventually I fell in love with the German Shepherd because the German Shepherd was such a dog that could do almost anything. And yes, it is said that he is not the best at anything, but he's the best at everything. Uh, there are other breeds, Malinois, uh, there are other breeds that, that are, very close or equal to, and, and some people prefer them over German Shepherds, uh, but the German Shepherd is a breed that I particularly had fallen in love with, and over maybe 25 years now uh, or more, been breeding that particular dog consistently. Which brings me to another topic, or a question that I wanted to ask you. Um, to the benefit of our viewers and listeners, right? I may know, but 
I want you to, to, to tell everybody is you are involved in so many different organizations, right? You founded the, the Universal Schutzhund Club. You um, founded the FCRTT, right? Together with a few others. Um, why the involvement in so many um, organizations? The most recent is um, the RSV Global TNT. You know, what, what is the reason for having a leg in everything, so to speak? Yes, it is, it is uh, not so much by design, but by, by accident in that um, as I started to breed dogs in a, a serious way, and when I mean a serious way, uh, we live on an, in an island. We live on an island. Uh, we, are not, we, we don't have the benefit of being uh, on a continent like Europe where there are dogs everywhere and it's easy to get to them you know, over land and so on. Um, so really, if you had to build a breed, you, you must import at some time. And uh, when I started with the German Shepherd dog, uh, back in the late 80s and stuff like that in a serious way. Um, at that time, the German Shepherd had gone through or was going through a very low uh, period, a low time in, in Trinidad where it was uh, said that uh, German Shepherd dogs have hip dysplasia, they can't perform long. They, can't, they don't live long, and so on. And what really had existed here was there was a limited gene pool of dogs. And not only that, most of the dogs, uh, I would say over 95% of the, the German shepherds that were in Trinidad were out of the United Kingdom. And uh, at that time, things like uh, hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, uh, testing on the spine and so on was not a was not a big thing. That was only uh, happening in Europe or not just beginning to happen in Europe in a real way. So that uh, you find that there was no way of telling. There was no science behind it. There was no uh, data to help people when they breed dogs to know. Uh, what are the risks? What are the, 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 the propensities um, for dogs to come down with these kinds of conditions and so on? And this is another part of genetics. Uh, when we say genetics, we talk in th these things, um, traits or characteristics or inherent uh, possibility of disease or, uh, or disorders that can come down. It's all, uh, any dog is a product of his genetic history from the parents and grandparents and so on. And uh, what happens is in the absence of empirical data without the, the science behind it, you, you are playing a guessing game. So sometimes it might be years before you can see the problems that are existing in a bloodline or in a particular breed or certain bloodlines when they are combined that these problems uh, crop up. Uh, However, nowadays, um, you have a lot of, of, of science that is guiding um, how we breed. Um, if, if you have the ability, there's a, a website, working-dog.eu, where you can, uh, it's a very large, it's a worldwide uh, website, and you can see very many different breeds. But beyond that, there's a lot of science-based uh, information about the dogs, uh, so on. And if you know what you're doing, it's a good research tool. Coming back to your question about how I got involved in so many different organizations and why I went to tell you how my experience evolved, um, as I started to import dogs from other countries, from the UK, from Europe, in Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, in America, um, we, we would import purebred dogs. And these dogs would, would come with their pedigree certificates. And they will come with a Kormeister's report. A Kormeister is a specialist judge who is able to critique a dog in every way and uh, give a certification 
of the class of the dog, rate the dog grad in that way, um, and that will help us to inform how we breed. So the, 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 the judge can rate the dog in many different areas, and those ratings would inform what we will choose or which dogs we choose for breeding. And as we did that, um, I tried to implement or to, to, to encourage other people, other breeders here in Trinidad to adopt these kinds of standards, uh, which was a difficult thing and still is a difficult thing to do in Trinidad, to be very honest. And uh, not many, we, we have good breeders. We have very good breeders in Trinidad. We have quite a good bit of genetics, a good gene pool uh, with most dogs now, but we have a few good breeders. Uh, I'm not trying to discredit anybody, but the reality is not, not many breeders want to adhere to standards, not many breeders uh, do the necessary research, and not many breeders are particular about what they breed. And so the bottom line, the money aspect is very attractive, so people just breed dogs on that basis. Whereas real breeders, passionate breeders, they love the breed and they want to propagate the breed. That's the whole point of it. So the organizations um, had, to had to come into existence as all part of what will be a final structure to help people so, uh, to breed proper dogs. So the FCRTT is a registry body that requires breeders to, to microchip their dogs and have DNA testing on their dogs for the purpose of breeding. At least we can identify the dogs, at least we can start to identify the traits that we're seeing if dogs are coming down with hip dysplasia and so on, and we can start to do something about it because we have data. The Universal Schutzen Club, uh, we needed a group of people who were dedicated to working with these dogs competing with these, with these dogs and training them. That way we can really see how the characteristics of the dogs are playing out, how which dogs are performing better, which bloodlines are performing better. So it helps the breeders. So, so it's a well. testing ground. It's a testing ground. Everyone. You're, Royal, testing, you're yeah. testing the genetics. Yeah. So Royal Valley ID was, was developed around having to do all the identification through DNA, from, through microchipping and so on, testing for diseases and all these various things. Um, the RSV, which is the most recent, uh, is a uh, group founded in Germany uh, by Dr. Helmut Reiser, one of the great men in the dog world, and especially with German Shepherds. Um, and it, is, it was founded almost for the very same reason. It's a breed club, essentially, for the German Shepherd dog and the Belgian Malinois. Uh, however, it's also a working organization, working dog organization, for, again, because that element of training and testing is very important and advises your breeding. So the RSV uh, is now uh, present in Trinidad and Tobago. We have the RSV Global Trinidad and Tobago. We are part of the RSV family that is growing at a rapid rate because the German Shepherd Dog, the Malinor, even the Doberman, the Rottweilers, they are all suffering from one Big problem. All purebred dogs, especially the, the popular working dogs, are suffering from a big problem or starting to see where, because the gene pool sometimes is not so large, problems can crop up with breeding dogs of the same genetics, the same bloodlines. So the vigor that may have been in the dog, let's say in the German Shepherd dog, the vigor that, that would have been there because uh, Captain Stephanus would have used maybe six different breeds to create the German Shepherd dog. So there will be a lot of vigor there because coming from all those different bloods, there will be a lot of diversity. But over time, because a standard had to be developed that the, the dog that you want has to fit a particular description, you start to breed more concentrated to get the same result all the time. And that in, of, in and of itself, over many decades, the vigor and diversity is dropping, okay? Mm -hmm. And that is something that only with data, you can help to minimize the, the negative effects of that. So I'm not um, uh, 
trying to discredit pure breeding at all. That is very important. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, vocation. However, at some stage, we have to face the issue of, uh, it's called the inbreed coefficient, or sometimes when we breed the uh, ancestral loss coefficient. So we have to manage and not breed dogs too closely. So you, of course, it's not uh, advised to breed a father to a daughter and that kind of thing. So that, that is part of it. And that is what advises us of how we should breed, when we should breed, and that kind of thing. It's also to, to prevent a, a loss of workability in the dogs. Definitely. Right? Because they're getting softer and softer, and then they can't, to the point where some of them can't perform the task anymore. Yes. Well, one mm -hmm. of the, one of the uh, issues uh, that we face internationally, and um, it's not a bad thing, except that, like anything else, it can go too far. So the, the general welfare uh, of the dogs, uh, there are people who are animal rights activists and animal welfare activists, and that's a good thing. We, we love that. We, we all should love our dogs and want to get the best for our dogs. Uh, however, what has happened is that, that that movement has gone to the point where in Europe, um, certain types of training and I'm not arguing against it, but certain types of training have been disbanded, and maybe rightly so in some cases. However, uh, for the purpose of preparing dogs, let's say for military use, for police use, for search and rescue use, for, for use that, is re that requires dogs to be really, really tough, if you do not have a way and a means of testing that toughness, and if you soften the, the bar, reduce, lower the bar that is required to test these dogs to prove that they are able to perform in the field. For, this, for us human beings, whether it be on the battlefield, whether it be in a collapsed uh, urban structure, what, whatever it is, if those, if those bars for testing are dropped so low and dogs that are not really able to handle it, when they go out in the field, they fail then we as human beings also suffer. Okay, yes. so and this is part of the problem. And, and one of the issues in Europe is also that there's this huge difference between welfare and activism. They're not the same at all. Yes. Right? And in many cases, it's less about the welfare and more about the activism. Wow. Right? Yes. And you see more and more groups in, 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 in Europe voicing that. They're finding the courage one by one to, to actually put that out in the open because it's about control more than anything else, right? Yeah. And um, you see it in, 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 in our spot in, in Schutzhund, or IGP as it is now called, where piece by piece, people are chipping away on aspects of that competition which will soften the standards more and more. And then you no longer have the testing ground that it was created to be. Yeah. Well, yes. Right? So Schutzhund started to test dogs for police dog service. That's how it started. To have a common denominator that everybody has to fulfill to test the dog how good or bad they're faring in those exercises. Yes. Right? That is that is what started it. And now you you can no longer pretend to have the touch with the, with the padded stick because apparently just waving it is wrong. <laughs> And it it, it, it it takes on ridiculous forms at times. Yeah. Well, yeah. And to me, that is somewhat dangerous to do this. Because you will get dogs that then perform as police dogs or as military dogs that have never been truly tested. And that can cost somebody their life. Definitely. You know? Yeah. Is this how you... Well... Yes, you know, so if you have a canine, canine and an officer team that go out there in the performance of their duties, if they never were allowed to really test the dog, how you know what the dog is going to do when, when somebody shoots or when, when you know, the, the yeah. dog's courage is really required? Yeah. Um, you know, I can, I can see this trend causing some harm. Well, yes, it's a, it's a great debate and... Um, there are merits to some of the, the, the or there is merit 
to some of the arguments. Uh, however, the 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 the, the, the fo it's a, it's becoming a, 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 a overwhelming force in terms of the activism activism now, and um, we can we have seen we have seen where dogs that um, uh, let's say winning the world championships or maybe the the Bundesliga profile. Um, and historically, it's been so too that we know that this not always the champion dog is the best dog for us. Right. It, it might be the best trained dog, or it might be the easiest dog to train, and and so on. However, ultimately, if you if you remove the 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 means and the ability to put the dog through certain types of tests, without of course being cruel, I, and I, I I don't want at all to be I want to make it clear that I am also um, in favor of making sure uh, in terms of the safety and the care for the animals that is paramount. we all are. Yeah, right, yeah. Is, so, I don't think that is even my question. Yeah, right? but, but, but I feel it's, it's, it's important to say it because I don't want the impression to be there that, you know, we want to be able to do cruel things to dogs no, to test them. not at all. So I, want the, I don't want that. That is not at all even the conversation. Mm -hmm. Um... But the point is, if you remove or lower the bar for the testing too much, then the ultimate result of that is that human lives can be lost somewhere. And, and that is what we have to uh, manage. Um, and hopefully, we will strike a happy balance somewhere. Hopefully, uh, because... You, you have worldwide organizations like the OIE and the FCI and, you know. Um, so the key to it, in my mind, will be to find a balance. What is the balance? And we have to also be able to, to argue and, and, and advocate for proper testing. Even when there's something that suggests, or a group that is suggesting that, you know, these kinds of testing is cruel. We have to find the right balance. And I agree that we need laws and we need regulations to manage how people train and breed and test dogs. I, I am all for that, but which, in the proper way, of course. Which brings me to another question that I wanted to ask you, um, and that is the issue of ethical breeding. No, oh, that's a big one. <laughs> that's that's my that's one of my uh, pet peeves, Michael. One of my pet peeves. Um, we we have a a big problem with that here in Trinidad, and indeed around the world. And all of this has led to to these groups of activists, which. Well, they, they, they advocate for certain things, and quite rightly so, because we know that there are breeders who have what you call a puppy mill. Yep. So they are churning out dogs regardless. I mean, uh, you know, they, these are the real enemies of, of dogs. People who breed dogs without doing any research, without trying to determine the suitability of these dogs for breeding. Um, these are the people who are, we have to find a way to, to deal with. Um, and, and, and every country should have, have laws that would, 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 would uh, mitigate against that. You may not be able to completely eliminate it. However, if every dog breeder or dog owner has to be registered, and maybe, like in Europe, attract taxes and so on. It would it would help to minimize uh, the, the 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 frequency with which you see people breeding dogs carelessly. I mean, you just have to go on the internet, social media. Uh, as a German Shepherd breeder, when I see somebody advertise a Panda Shepherd for sale. Yeah, they, 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 they're now calling something a panda shepherd. 
Yeah. The German Shepherd dog has a standard, one standard. Now, some people argue about, I, I've seen something on the internet where somebody talked about how many different types of shepherds, and they're talking about the East German Shepherd, and the Czech Shepherd, and the West German Shepherd, and the Showline Shepherd, and the Working Line Shepherd. And to, to some degree, there are differences, and the Showline dog has evolved somewhat distinctly different from the Working Line dogs. Yeah. But the German Shepherd dog has a standard, a single standard. And until... The people who created the dog decides to make a change. The dog has one standard. And nowhere in that standard says anything about a panda shepherd. Meaning a dog that has white and black with spots in the eye. There's no such thing like that. The color white is not accepted in the German shepherd standard. German shepherds can have white. What is acceptable is a small spot maybe on, on the chest. A small spot, and I want to emphasize small, uh, but not something like a, a dining. If you're going to dinner and you have a, a, a bib, a bib. <laughs> that's not part of the standard. White, there are white German shepherds, but you have to understand how they evolve. Most, in most cases, it's from breeding a particular bloodline, which is, uh, which is inbreeding over and over. White is a color that will come up and become dominant in the gene pool. And therefore, you can start to produce white shepherds. But uh, it's also somewhat of a recessive gene. It right? is a recessive gene. That carries blindness, right. deafness, uh, cancer. Right. So it's displeasure. Right. And the reason why white is not a, a, an accepted color is because of that. The, 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 the ability or the propensity for it to carry with it a lot of diseases and, and issues that will affect the dog in its own lifetime. So that in and of itself is a reason to advocate against it. Um, and that happens in other breeds to Dobermans and stuff like that. But there are people, there are breeders who make a very good living off of breeding, white German Shepherds or white Dobermans and stuff like that. Um, so the German Shepherd dog, I want to reiterate, has a standard, a single standard. And if you read the standard, there are Colors that can be black and tan, black and red, black, sable, uh, bicolor, um, you know, solid black. And that's basically, you know, some, that's about it. But um, fawn is not a color in the German Shepherd dog. Red is not a color in the German Shepherd dog. Panda. Blue is not a color in the German Shepherd Panda is not a color in the German Shepherd dog. And something to me has to be done about this, even if it means me helping to form another organization <laughs> to do that, at some stage, we have to get around to solving that problem. But this kind of thing, I am telling you, if people, if the registry bodies would stand up and unite, and the other organizations stand up and unite, this couldn't happen. But it is being allowed because people are comfortable making money of a fad and fashion, and people who have no education, people who do not avail themselves of the information and knowledge that's available, and therefore people buy these dogs out of fashion. So people are a white, a white German Shepherd or a blue German Shepherd. All these things they have been proven scientifically that there are a lot of negative consequences that come with these dogs and these colors. Yeah, and yet still it's, it's a money making. And it's thing. not limited to the German Shepherd. Right? It's we not. have we live in a tropical island with 34 degrees and 90% humidity. And one of the most popular dogs here is the, hus the husky. Yeah. And now you have the Shepsky and the Malski and the, because the huskies are so popular. So people just mix them with, with anything they can find to call it something new to set themselves apart from others. And as a trainer, I'm getting calls from people who have those dogs and the problems that come with it. Because it's a little bit, when you mix breeds like this, it's a little bit like playing lotto. Anything can happen. You can get a dog that is very docile and you can get Cujo. Right? And people simply don't know. They say, oh yeah, it's cute. And then buy a puppy and when the dog is nine months old and they almost missed uh, the first digit, then they call the trainer and say, we need some help. 
Yes. And then you you go there and you see the dog and it, it's it's to me it's it's heart wrenching to see what people have done with some dogs in terms yeah. of indiscriminate breeding. Yeah, it's terrible. I mean, some of those dogs suffer greatly with the heat one, the humidity two, and having had huskies in Europe, their exercise requirement is really really high. They want to run. They want to run all day. That is that is in their genetics, right? That is, they were bred to pull sleds for miles and miles. And here they cannot get that exercise due to overheating. So they're constantly somewhat miserable because they can't, as we say in Trinidad, they can't flex. They can't, you know, let go of that energy because they do half a mile and they overheat. Yeah. Right? Whereas somewhere else they would run 20 kilometers. In one piece and barely breathe hard. So, with that comes then behavioral problems because they get frustrated. You know, all one has to do is ask to do a survey among a hundred veterinarians and see how many of them got bitten by a husky mix. It's staggering. It's yes. staggering. I get calls all the time, and it's it's crazy. Right. Yeah, and it's a problem that yeah. is produced with no thought behind it. Fashion, you know, fad. Yeah, fad. Is after after the John Wick movie, everybody wanted a Malano. People who have not the skill set to their own one got one or two or three, and then you know, another thing I, I've observed is, is people getting siblings from the same litter. A brother and sister. Yeah, or, or two brothers. Yeah. Which is crazy. They're competing with each other since birth. You know, when you what people think is gonna happen when they get older. And then when they start fighting each other, it's like, how can we get them to get along? Yeah. You know? But you you can, then you have to let them know that you're the only one that's allowed to fight. And you have to rule with a with almost, you know, with an iron okay. fist or separate them. Right? And People yeah. are not not equipped to do those things, and they're not equipped to recognize those things, and it's go out and buy a dog. Yeah. You know, and, and I always try to, whenever I train a dog for a client, I'm always trying to educate them. Yeah. So a good portion of that training session while I'm working with the dog is me talking nonstop to, to try and, and give people the information that they need um, if they ever get another dog, so they can be making a, a more informed decision on what yeah. to get and you know, what breed, what type, and, and so forth, that suits their lifestyle better. Yeah, I, I, agree, I you know, agree, I agree. And then most of them tell me, I wish I had met you earlier. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, we, see, we see a lot of the Shepskis, um, the German Shepherd and uh, Husky mix. Uh, now uh, we have a lot of that. Um, the, 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 there are many problems that come along with that that kind of experience. First of all, people bought the, the, the huskies because they have blue, different color eyes. One eye might be blue, the other might be gray, and they're furry looking. And so as a puppy, they're beautiful. Um, and then they realize now this dog goes up, it's uncomfortable in the climate. Um, they don't bark the same way no dogs bark. Like they have a somewhat different vocal cord. And uh, they're not the most social dogs either. No. Nope. And then somewhere they breed it with a German Shepherd. And this German Shepherd might not be such or the most stable German Shepherd either. May have some nerve issues. Mm -hmm. Hence the reason why vets are getting bitten all the time. Because you now put two completely different breeds or, or you know, together. And, and, they, and, and they carry more predation than the husky, right? Certainly. Because that has been bred out of the husky. Correct. Because the, the, the husky environment in, in cold countries where they do sledding, right? It's all human based. Yeah. So on the checkpoints, it's human that catch your dogs to, yeah. to, to bring them to a stop and so forth. So the dogs cannot be human aggressive. Yeah. So that was bred out of them. And then you take a, a, a German Shepherd who is who can be a predator and put that gene right back into the dog yeah. in in one in one mating in a weird you, you put into the husky uh, which is a very close relative to the wolf yes genetically 
a gene that people spend hundreds of years getting out of the brain. Yeah. So it's, it's about it's you know, um, and then and then what is happening now, or what is also dangerous, is that when you breed, let's say a German Shepherd and a Husky, and maybe one comes out looking more like a German Shepherd. Not re- you're not really seeing Un- for the untrained eye. Uh, there are those that can look. That's a German Shepherd, and then we have a situation in Trinidad where it is possible to have that dog now registered as a German Shepherd. Yeah, <laughs> and then probably bred as a German Shepherd. So down the road, somebody advertises a Panda Shepherd for sale <laughs> with papers, or you know, papers. We say papers. They they mean it's a registered dog. What they really trying to say is a pedigree dog. But in fact, it's not. It's a mixed bred dog. Yeah. And all the consequent or attendant problems with it. So I think we can leave that there for now, you know. <laughs> um, but the whole idea, for example, if you just, in Trinidad, we have a dog called a pot hound, which is commonly referred to, which is a dog that runs on the street. It's a million different dogs. A stray dog. Of, yeah, it's a stray, a stray dog, right? A Caribbean Shepherd or a Dustbin Terrier, or whatever you want to call it. And and these dogs have a very diverse background and pedigree. But uh, essentially, they generally are small. They are brown in color because of how they were bred and the same family of dogs breeding each other. But because dogs of different breeds have been put in there, they have a pretty strong immune system. They, 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 they're very durable, you know. And some people say it's better to get a pot hound than a purebred dog. He doesn't need any vaccinations and all of that kind of thing. Um, but you know, when you're doing that, you don't know what you're getting. You can you, you cannot uh, account or you cannot uh, predict the behavior or the look or whatever it is. No, I I volunteer a lot of time at the local shelter, at the TTSPCA, and um, work with some of their dogs. And let me tell you, you look at a dog and they they sit there and they look at you one way and the moment you open that kennel door, they just morph into a different dog. It's either they they come and they want to growl and be very defensive out of of fear most of the time, right? Because they're not very nerve strong. Or they go into the other end of the kennel and stare at the floor and shut down. You know, and so I'm I'm trying to work with some of them to to show them okay, not everybody's gonna treat you badly, you know, and and try to to rehabilitate some of them so that they can become more adoptable, and um, that's why we we now feature dogs and put them through a, a training program with Dog Point. And then adopt them out. To, and then adopt them out. Yeah. yeah. So that they one day they they get more prominent through the videos, so more people see and know about them. And then people think, okay, if I adopt this dog, I'm getting a, a trained dog. <laughs> well, Right? Which is kind of the idea. Well, this, this Right? Yeah. And, and you have a dog that is not jumping all over yeah. you, that walks on a loose leash and, and so forth, so that it could become the family dog that they're looking yeah. for almost right away. Yeah. Right? With some minor adjustments in the household. Yeah. And so that is the idea, is to help those dogs get adopted. Well, yes, and right? also because there's a lot yeah. of people that are willing to adopt, and we have a very large stray dog population due to all that indiscriminate breeding, this is the point. right? Because somebody is promised a dog with certain characteristics and gets the puppy, and then six or nine months later realize the dog is not at all as advertised, and oftentimes people just give up the dogs, put them in the shelter, or let them go. They put them out in the street, you know, yeah. because it was not what they were looking for. Yeah. And if you look for a certain breed of dog, you should be able to go to a breeder and get what you're looking for. Yeah. You know, so so there's a lot of work well, to be done. Well, <laughs> and I know you, yeah. you're on the forefront of doing just that yeah. work, as frustrating as it may be. You know, so thank you for that. If, if, people, if people would, let's say they, they, they bought a puppy, it was a nice furry ball of love and thing in the beginning, and then eventually realize they don't like the dog. That's one thing. To put it out on the street 
or just take it for a drive and throw it out somewhere, that's a different thing. If they were to take the dog to the shelter, at least the shelter has a chance of either training this dog a little bit and getting it adopted okay. out so the dog never gets on the street to be bred and have 10 puppies on the street because in the shelter they will spay or neuter this dog. So it's not in the population to create more dogs. Yeah, it's not in circulation. And it's off the street because it's adopted out. Um, that's, a, that's at least a good thing. If you don't, if you know you, you have a dog that you don't want, take it to the shelter. Take it to the shelter. Don't just indiscriminately take this dog for a drive by a beach or in the bush somewhere and drop it off. Because what you're doing, you're adding to a very serious problem we have with the stray dog population. And these yeah. stray dogs that are roaming all over, there are also implications for disease, diseases and so on um, that can affect the human population. Also consequences for wildlife. Yes. Right? So this is the kind of problem that we face because of indiscriminate breeding. And because there's no consequence to breeding dogs because you have two dogs in your yard, you, you're not... But if people had to pay taxes, if people had to register their dogs, if people had to, to account for the dogs in the yard... And microchip them. And microchip them and stuff like that, you find that this problem will, will reduce significantly. Yeah, we, so, should, we should have a legal framework where the dog is microchipped and you get some form of a, a cheap license. doesn't yeah. have to be expensive. To make it prohibited. Well, that was that was but, actually on the law but, books. But before. when you but when you when you sell a puppy, you have to sign sign over, and the, the new owner has to re-register. Of course. So that whatever actions your dog performs, as the owner, you're responsible for the actions of your dog. Of course. And then we also get a lot of those dog and human accidents and 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 incidents incidents. Inc- Incidents. Incidents. <laughs> Sorry, folks. German speaking English. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, multiple problems could be fixed that way. Of course. But it would need some sort of, you know, government input to yeah. make that happen. Yeah. If, if, if we can use this platform as a means for asking the powers that be uh, in local government, in the Attorney General's office, uh, to look at the legislation that controls or guides it, the Dog Control Act and put the teeth to it, give local government the teeth, and it will be a way, a good source of bringing revenue to the government. Um, but what it will really do is reduce that stray dog population and it will cause people to have to be more ethical about... And more responsible with their dogs. Of course, of course. That's, you know? that's a major, major problem we have here. And we've been fighting with this for years. Every now and then, somebody gets mauled in the road or in a family situation, and then there's a big hurrah, but it dies away. And nothing is really being done. And what you find happening now with all these different breeds being mixed, and there are some breeds that are being imported into the country, it's only a matter of time before more people die. Unfortunately, that is the result of inaction, whether it's on the part yeah. of you know NGOs, or the government, or whatever. We need to come together to to offset this this problem, but because it's going to get worse. Yeah. So, one other aspect um, to change direction a little bit on on breeding is um, so you have. The behaviors in the dog that you want and then you have the other side is how the dog looks and the Fe- features of the we dog. We call it phenotype and genotype. genotype. Right. So I, w- I would want you to get a little bit into that uh, so that m- more people who watch this, yeah. lay people, yeah. can understand why that is important in, in a breeding program. Yeah, sure. Okay, so it goes back to everything we were talking about before. So the idea is you want some degree of predictability in the behavior of the dog. So if you're selling a German Shepherd dog, it has a, there's a standard. And that standard says to someone, this is a dependable dog. 
It's a good family dog. It's a good family protector. Easily trained. Um, okay, has a, a double coat. Might shed coat twice for the year, and so on. But there, there is predictability about what you're going to get, and that is essential. So predictability means that in the case of uh, the phenotype of the dog, the dog should be is going to be for males. Let's say. 24 inches at the withers. Females maximum 22 inches, something like that. Um, again, color is an issue. Um, and I, I spoke about a comaister before. They, they will critique the eyes, the shape of the eyes. Color of the, the eyes. Color of the eyes. It's as said, the shape of the eyes, the way it sits on the head, and all of that. And the reason for that is you want to get so whoever created it want to get some consistency in the way this is done. If not, if everybody has the right to make changes, to add different things, then you've gone back to a mixed bread dog and you can have the full spectrum. Uh, so dogs that are purebred, you want, first of all, the character of the dog to be stable. Um, you want to be able to rely on this dog because based on, on this character, we can now train this dog to search and rescue. You have a situation in Turkey or Mexico or Japan or places where you have uh, earthquakes on a regular basis. Um, you want to be sure that this dog will go into that urban area with collapsed buildings and really look and find people who are alive. So first of all, that dog has to be able to dis discern a body that is, let's say, four meters or whatever below ground, that there's a, a person who is alive there as a person who is dead there. It requires the development of that olfactory gland. And um, that is probably the strongest instinct the dog has, right? Um, if you have dogs that you are mixing, well, then you, you can never be sure about how it will be because you're not consistent, yeah. right? Um, you want a dog with a lot of courage to go over rough surfaces, debris falling, loud noises, whatever it may be, dark, small spaces. Dog must have the nerve and the strength and the character to do that. You need predictability. Um, in the case of military or police, where there's gun, uh, gunfire, the, you know, you have all these sirens, whatever it might be, even uh, an assailant fighting back, Striking the dog, whatever it is. You need predictability. An officer can lose his life if yeah. there's no predictability in the and character. It has happened. It, it, has has happened. it has happened. I, I've seen um, video footage, dash cam footage of, of yes. canines in the US yes. where because of the dog suddenly getting scared, the officer died. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that is something that just simply should not yeah. happen. If you select the right dogs with the right nerve strength, that is not something yes. that, that just happens. Yeah. There was somewhere, somewhere along the line, the, there was a wrong decision taking in, in putting this dog into service. Yeah. You know, be it due to lack of testing or, or being not testing enough circumstances, you know. Correct. And um, as you say, consistency, right? You know, I, I love Rottweilers. And right now, I have a dog that is the, the first dog I ever had in my life that is not afraid of anything. And I mean anything. I've tried for two years to find something that he's scared. Nothing. It just, nothing phases him. Yes. He looks at everything straight on and says, yeah, okay, cool, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's amazing. And you know, our buddy Aaron, Aaron Thomas from Vanhead Vanguard Kennels yes. did a fantastic job with that litter because the consistency. This is this is a feature that they all have. You know, all all the yes. puppies in that litter are, are like that. Yes. You know. Which So the, so, the, he, so he, yeah. he's another candidate for, for a podcast. He's already <laughs> yeah. earmarked um yeah. the talk about, about the Rottweilers yeah. and the breed. Um, 
Yeah, it's 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 a joy to 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 just see a dog. The dog I got from you, Ninja, he was like this too. Yeah. You know, he couldn't wait in 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 detection to to climb around in the suspension of a ten axle crane. Yeah. You know, to to, to, to check for narcotics. He, yes. he he was he loved it. He would get antsy when he see when he saw that crane coming down the driveway. Yes. Because he got so excited. Yeah. Knows it's time to, to work. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And. It, that to me as a trainer is is the greatest thing on earth to see a dog get excited to go to work under some circumstances that you know even humans would be very reluctant to perform this task well that's the reason why we have the dogs because you know it, it <laughs> i remember i remember a, a container with tools and somewhere in transport something they, i don't know if they drove through a pothole or everything was held a skelter in that container and we had to search it and I wanted to, to, to shine a light in it to see if there's anything that could injure him. And by the time I switched on the light, he was already halfway down the, cor- the, the, the container yeah. in darkness doing his job. Yes. You know. Dependability. Yes. Predictability. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, uh, people underestimate the value of this. And the breeders who do not do their research and who do not uh, breed in for these reasons and who breed just because they want to sell a litter of puppies they're doing a real disservice to the breed and um that is that is the unfortunate thing about the the environment we have the unregulated uh uncontrolled environment in which we operate um and it, it's 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 really unfortunate um so so the whole question of phenotype and genotype um even from the the, the when you're talking that you're talking about the temperament of the dog, yeah. the nerves of the dog. For your dog to have gone into that container, nerves had to be strong. He had to be able to overcome noises or a dark environment where his sight, his eyesight has dropped, you know, and it was his vision, there's no vision, the ability to see what is happening. Yet still use the power of that nose to guide him. Yeah. But he has to have the temperament, the courage, the strength of character to be able to do that and the physical ability to yes, climb over everything of eh? course right so especially in the in, for the services uh in the military in the police in the paramilitary um you know search and rescue in these kinds of uh in detection areas these kinds of this character the attributes that we need from the dogs you, you you cannot be guessing. This it's not like, it's not something you can take up a dog, let's say, off the street and hope that he does this. Mm. But maybe maybe he may have some ability to do some of the work, but can he really do all of it? And then yeah. sometimes it takes months before you can figure out. I mean you, you, you get mixed dogs that, that are in service. Of course. But that is that is a is the opposite approach. Yes. Somebody discovered this dog. Yes. And realize that they have this potential, yeah. and then put them through a training program, and they have proven themselves. Yes. But that was coincidence. Yes. Yes. That is not okay. Hey, I think this yeah. dog can do this. Yeah. You know, and then the dog does, and it's, mm-hmm. that's great. But you cannot replicate it with yeah. that dog because even if you breed that dog, chances are that none of the puppies will be capable of doing this because there's no consistency there. That that could have been a one-off. And might might you I know? add? Might I add that even the best of circumstances, even with the pedigree dogs, the purebred dogs, it doesn't always work out. No. It doesn't. It <laughs> you doesn't. know, you have a better chance if you really drill down on, on your research. But there are, it has happened to me. Just did not work out. I didn't get what I wanted. Um so I no I'm not I am not even here trying to profess to know everything, right? Um and anybody who tells you that, mm, they're not very I mean, real. An, anybody who, who competed in world championships in IGP went from multiple dogs before they got there. Many times, yes. You know? <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> Until they found the dog that was the dog. Yeah. That that will hold his water on the day. Yeah. You know, despite all these destructions, we're talking about a football yeah. stadium and a PA system yeah. and large crowds and... Yeah. And all of that, and, and has the nerve strength to, to block all of this out and perform the task that yeah. he was trained for. And Mark, if, if, I, if you just allow me uh, just to sort of uh, explain 
how we come about this? How do you do this? How do we, how do we figure this out? How do we, where do we start? Well, it starts from the understanding of how dogs behave naturally in the wild. Um, and, and, and how they survive. Because ultimately, everything wants to survive. Everything wants to better its position. Everything wants to thrive. And in the, in the wild, because the, the characteristics and the, 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 the things that are good about the dogs that we use, we didn't make them that way. They are, they are that way. That's, that's a genetic thing. What we do is try to enhance it. We try to channel it in a particular way. We try to make it more pronounced. But it, you cannot make a dog that is with weak nerves. You cannot make it a strong dog with strong nerves. A dog that is a coward cannot be a dog that is brave. A dog that is uh, uh, has uh, hip problems genetically coming down will produce that consistently or will have a higher chance of producing it. So when we look at the original, the, what we call the pack structure, and some people have varying uh, versions of this, uh, you have basically uh, in the animal kingdom you see it, a lot, you have what we call the alpha, who is at the top, he's the leader of the pack, and you have just under the alpha, uh, the ones that sort of are like the enforcers, the, the, the guys that carry out the big instructions, so that we call them the beta. Uh, I call the people, the guys below that, the, the delta, who are the main body and group, and the last rung of that is like the Omega. And this is actually, the Omega is actually the weakest group in the entire set. What they do, generally how packs operate and how uh, prides operate, even in lions you see this kind of behavior. The weaker ones are actually on the extreme of, if they physically lay down to rest. The alpha gets himself either on a high perch, a rock or something like that, and they, they, they spread out. And you find that the weaker ones are like on the periphery. They're on the periphery for several reasons. One, because they are weaker, they are not allowed or accepted so much in the group. They get the comfort and the security of being part of that group, but they do not make decisions in that group. They do not control when they go or where they go or when they hunt or when they don't hunt. They do not have mating rights in that group or procreation rights in that group. They are basically the outliers. They are there to be part. They have security of being in that group. And what happens is if there are intruders or so on, um, they will make a noise. They can create an alarm. They can be the first point that says, hey, somebody's coming or whatever. And then it's left to maybe the, the warriors, the, 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 the deltas and the betas to decide who will go and fight and so on. For the purpose of hunting, killing, eating, surviving. Uh, that's why you have the betas and you have the, the deltas. They're the main body that will do all the work defending the, 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 the pride, defending the pack, and that kind of thing. Of course, mating is the right of the alpha. He chooses yeah. his, 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 his females and so on. And there might be an alpha female. She will determine which females might actually get to meet with the alpha. And so on. And um, this, these characteristics that the different levels will display has everything to do with how the pack will survive, how the species or the breed will survive. And therefore, you find that for the purpose of even surviving, just simple surviving, it, is, it has created a structure. And that structure says the alpha has to be strong. He has to have strong nerves. He has to be willing to fight anybody and everybody. At any day, at any time, he has to be ready to fight and defend his pride, defend his back. Okay, the, the betas are the ones, when the alpha gets too old, one of them might kill him and take his place. And they have to be ready to do the same thing as he did, and so on and so on. And this, if you, if you analyze those uh, characteristics, break them down into drive, hunting drive, prey drive, fight drive, play drive, mating drive, all these are drives. Even with dogs, a dog that does not have a, a strong mating drive, nine out of ten times he will not carry some of the other character traits that make him dominant, that give him prepotency, 
And therefore, if we know what we're looking for, we can breed in that way and produce good dogs. Yep. Put the right dogs together. Precisely. And you have all the different to criteria. Get, to get the results. Yes, that you're correct. Looking for. Yes. And then try and get some consistency in. Yeah. Right? Right? And, um, yeah, so it, it, I've met some really confident dogs from your kennel, from Aaron's kennel, um, and others. And um, it is disheartening for me as a trainer oftentimes when somebody calls me and they, they have a German Shepherd or they have a, a Rottweiler and I go and I see the dog as a puppy or as a juvenile and I see certain characteristics in the dog that should not be there. Yeah. Like very weak nerves. You know, just trying to give them some food. They're peeing because they're scared. You know, I've been talking about a, a not not an eight-week-old puppy. We're talking about a nine-month-old or a one-year-old dog. Yeah. You know, for a working line dog to behave like this, you know something went fundamentally wrong somewhere. Yes. And I feel sorry for the people who purchased those dogs because they bought a dog of a certain breed because they were looking for a companion slash guard dog and are bitterly disappointed with what they got. But it's there. So I say, okay, most most people, most of my clients, they, they will not get rid of the dog. And I say, okay, he's here. So let's see what we, the best we can do, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm trying to help them and, and, and make the dog obedient and so forth and, and try to expose the dog to different stimuli to... to try to give the dog some coping mechanisms to, to deal with this fear. Because it will never go away. It's genetic. It's there. Yes. Right? But to condition the dog somewhat so that it's not as detrimental and as stressful for the dog. So it doesn't produce cortisol all his life. Yes. And because it will shorten his lifespan. Yes. Right? So, but more often than not, that is what I see. Yeah. And knowing guys like you and Aaron and to have you as friends and brothers and then see a dog like this, it's like, <laughs> the things I want to say, and I can't, I have to behave myself, you know. Um, you know, I said, okay, yeah. when, when you're looking for a dog again, you know, talk yeah. to me. <laughs> and, and nine out of ten clients says, I wish I had met you earlier. Yeah. You know. So, Mark, one of the things I want to add, and I want to, uh, for the purpose of qualifying what I would have said just now, um, any characteristic, whether phenotype or genotype, there is a spectrum. It's not a single mark. So in terms of, let's say, nerve, the strength of the mm -hmm. dog, nerve, uh, let's, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, if you had to breed a dog, um, of course you will not breed a zero. Uh, you certainly probably wouldn't even breed, for me, I will not breed a dog that is less than seven and a half in terms of nerve, maybe eight, around there. I also may not breed a dog that is 10 in nerve. And someone will ask, well, how, why not? What the function of what we call nerve um, in a dog is, it has to do with the, the reactivity of that dog to stimuli, to environment, to other uh, things that will, will create some kind of reaction or behavior. Not the easiest to handle. Yes. So someone might say, well, I want a dog that is 10 in nerve. And then we talk about fight drive or prey drive. I want a dog that is 10 in prey drive or 10 in fight drive or 10 in, in defense. If you're a person like this, you better up your game because that dog... Yeah has the potential to be, if you're, if you're not the, 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 the strong enough handler with that dog, that has the potential yeah. for problems. So, so that is exactly the point. So a dog that is too strong, if I should use that term, uh, let's say a dog that is 10 in nerve, 10 in fight drive, 10 in pre-drive, 
10 in, in rank drive. Rank, rank drive. Because rank drive is an important drive. A dog could be very good, a very good hunter. He could be a good fighter and everything. But he doesn't feel he needs to rule the pack. So his rank drive is not necessarily so high. Uh, he's not going to let somebody rough him up. But he doesn't feel he needs to rule over everyone. That's actually a perfect type of dog. Because that dog will, is, will normally be a beta or a delta. And he's there to carry out the instructions of the alpha. Right? Um, and and uh, we've had seminars where you hear people talk about they want, they want a dog 10 in every drive. But what they don't understand, that is also a dangerous animal. Yep. That's an animal you will not want in a family scenario. That's an animal is not even going to take instructions from the, help, the handler. He might get up one day and say, hey, I'm not going to do what you tell me. And then he will see you as his competition, as a, you trying to be the alpha. Because within the home environment, the dog recognizes most times the human as the alpha. And if you have a dog that says, hey, you, you're not my alpha, and he decides he's going to maul you that day. Yep. And a lot of people end up in those scenarios. So I think it's important for us to make it clear that there is a way it has to be done. There is, a, there is something like a sweet spot, right? Um, where a dog is actually very easy to train. Uh, you find this dog will be probably very high in prey. High to medium to high nerve. Um, good strong fight drive. Not so, not so high rank drive. And, and so that dog is not so much competing with me and wants to please me and wants to carry out my instructions, wants to be part of my pack, sees me and loves the comfort and the security of being with me and so on. So the dog enjoys being with me and loves to please me and loves to serve me. That dog is the perfect dog. Right. right. So these are some of the things I just wanted to make that clear. It's it's not just and that clear. is something that can happen across breeds. Of course. Right. I've had multiples, three years old, and asking me, so what is the main issue with the dog? Well, he has a long coat, but we can't groom him. Yeah, he won't tell the moment, you to touch the moment we come with the brush, he bites. Yeah. And so when a when a went there and then check out the dog he's not doing this out of fear mm -hmm. this dog is the tail is all the way up and he's looking you straight in your face and said if you get closer with this brush i'm gonna do I'm my best to, to harm you, you. I'm good right and mm, i got it done in the end but that was not an easy dog as small as he was <laughs> you know yeah. um and i believe that my my male force is just about on the on the edge of what I would want. He's not quite ten in everything, but he's close enough to where I say, okay, this should be the limit. Yeah, you have to know. You have to know your limit, which you know, know, because he's fine. You have to understand he's the breed fine, too. You have to, you know, yeah. and 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 he's under control and yeah. everything, but in the wrong hands. He has the potential to be dangerous, yeah. you know, because because he's unafraid, because he has very high nerve strength, and and has some level of rank drive and fight drive, you know. So he's not mm -hmm. the easiest the easiest dog to be around. Yeah. And after two and a half years, he has learned to yeah. to adapt to his to his situation. Yeah. So you know? remember, you know, some dogs. Uh, in their mind, the pack should only be two, which is you and him. And yeah. he's comfortable with that. He might not be so happy if there are other members come into the pack. You know, other dogs are quite happy with a larger pack. You know, so you have to know the dog. You have yeah. to know the breed and the characteristics of that breed. Why that breed was invented in the first place and what it was used for. And so... It mustn't be, be you, mu you should not buy a dog or acquire a dog or breed a dog because, quote unquote, he's nice. He's big. He has a big head. I like him or I like her. You know, those are not. As a, as a, a trainer, an online trainer puts it so eloquently, do not get a dog above your pay grade. 
<laughs> Maybe yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> I think it was um I wanna credit him. I think it was American Standard <laughs> training. Yeah. Um a fellow who speaks his mind no matter what, which is kinda what I like about him. And um yeah, he made that perfectly clear, you know, that yeah. there's people that get dogs that they shouldn't have. Because yeah. they don't have the skill set to handle the dog. It's not that the dog is a bad dog. It's just, you know, it, it, it goes over their head what, what is required, you know. Clearly. And yeah. I tend to agree with that. And I see it oftentimes, you know, where I have to tell people, I said, it's not really the right breed or dog for your lifestyle, you know. But it's here. So let's see what we can make work, yeah. you know. And then I try to help give them the skill set to, to, to handle their dog. And so far, we've been successful. You know, um, that's why a lot of people, when they get another dog, they come back. Yeah, you know? Know. Okay. Yeah. Right. So. Wait, how, how long yeah. do you want to go for? Because. <laughs> yeah, one hour, 15 minutes. So far. Right. Right. So, this breeding and genetics has so many topics. Oh, yes. If, if we, I think we have to make a, a multiple part series out of this because um, we just got started. Yeah, because we have to, you know, we have to drill down into blood, so actual much bloodlines. About, yeah. I mean, if you want to get specific, let's say, to the German Shepherd dog or the Rottweiler or the Doberman or the Malinois or any particular breed, then you each, start. Each breed would be a podcast. Yes, and then you have to, <laughs> yeah, but generally there are things that, you know, would affect them. But so you have to go down into specific bloodlines and the whole family tree of these dogs when these this particular bloodlines develops these unique characteristics uh one from another branch you know uh, you have to look at it like that the dogs uh, you have to see the whole pictures in order to yeah, to, to understand yeah, it yeah, yeah. so th i guess that's even a, another one where we can start a talk um about if you want to talk let's say the german shepherd dog we can talk about the pedigrees and what influences or what what I would do or the dogs that I have used, the bloodlines that I have used. Um, I guess we also have to talk about the registries at some stage and um, yeah, definitely. what makes one registry different from another um, because you have registries that would register dogs that are not purebred. So like uh, the NVBK uh, out of the Netherlands. They primarily uh concentrate on dogs that are working right they are not so much fixated on purebred dogs as opposed in, to in the knp can right. they the competition there but the police a, a, lot, of, a lot of dogs are mixed with right marlin shepherd Marlin's, and then that so shepherd and Marlin's that shepherd various things like that so but they will register the dogs the dogs are microchipped they have the any of you know but they will indicate that this is a belgian Marlin or this is a german shepherd in the pedigree so you understand what it is you have and which dogs would have influenced the outcome of this dog. So in a form, they're still keeping track of the dogs. They're still keeping the records. They're still managing hip and elbow dysplasia. All these various things can still be done. Uh, but their focus is on the, the work and workability of this dog. And they would add vigor or whatever they feel needs to be added by bringing in a dog of a different race if necessary. That is not such a bad thing. And even some of the purebreds have to start looking at that. Because over the next decade, it's going to become a major, major concern. Uh, German Shepherds, well, the Doberman, is, the Doberman breed is really in a bad way. The German Shepherds also, you know, in terms of their, their vigor, uh, needs to be looked at. Um, the Rottweilers as well. Uh, Rottweilers are very concentrated um, gene pool. Um, and and in, in some countries, uh, they're already looking at introducing maybe a dog of a different race in there. It has to be done in a calculated way. It has to be done in a scientific way. Yeah, because you want to preserve the breed. You yes. just want to strengthen it. You want to strengthen it. That's correct. You don't want to alter it. That's correct. So you so know. that that is something, a, a whole big topic. Actually, at the end of August, uh, August 26th and 27th, um, 
our our RSV uh, chairman is going to be in Trinidad, uh, Mr. Albert Spru. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name properly, uh, but he is going to be in Trinidad, and he has a lot of empirical data and and, and, and uh, which he's using to guide this kind of a topic. And I would advise anybody who is hearing my voice now to book a place. Pro it's probably going to be around the 24th or 25th where we're going to have a seminar on genetics. If you're a German Shepherd breeder, for sure, or a Malinois breeder, for sure, but even Rottweilers do women, if you're serious about breeding, you should book a seat at his seminar because some of what he has to say is going to bring a reality that most people are not aware of and it's going to really open our eyes a lot to why we have some of the problems we have with the breeds okay. and and that is going to be big so yes the rsv is having a big seminar and we're having a trial on the 26th and 27th igp trial schutzen trial um so that is also going to be very um interesting for people who are training and all the trainers out there uh in the igp shots and world um you know get ready you know be prepared to come on the field and show your work out you know and get your title for your dog and stuff like that um gain your bragging rights and so um but we welcoming everybody to participate and to to, to enjoy this this opportunity um over the next few months into the next couple of years the RSV is going to be doing phenomenal things together with the Universal Shots and Club, the FCR, TT, Rare Valley, ID, all the various kennels, and anyone who is interested in partnering with us, our sponsors. I have to, you know, give credit. I don't know if I should give any credit here to any of our sponsors, but um, maybe another time. But all our sponsors is going to be of great benefit to them and their products and stuff like that. So there's a big synergy that can take place. And, um, you know, we look forward to it. It's going to be a lot of exciting times ahead. That is what I've come to expect of you over the years. Events like this. Um, you're known for those. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I'd had the pleasure of being part of one of some of them. Yes. And, um, yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. I just love to see dogs compete. And handler and dog having fun more than anything else you know take the stress out of it a little it's bit a, and it's a beautiful and have fun it's have a very fun. It's, and it's a lot a of times handlers don't get that part you know it's because you're nervous and it, it's new and so everybody is is kind of tense and it translates into the dog yeah. you know well, it, i mean nobody can really help being nervous at least to, to some degree but um I've seen some people really, really, yeah. Well, clump up, and then the dog's like, "What's going on? It's, why, it's, why are you like this? Why are you behaving like this?" Um, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot of reasons for it. It's, it's the competitive nature of the, the sport. Um, the whole question of your, your our culture here in Trinidad. Let's say uh, we are still in a we are still in a young stage generally in Trinidad with. Uh, competing in sport. There are a lot of good guys out there training, um, you know, and I want to encourage them to continue. Um, the only way it's going to grow is if we come together and we, we come on the field and we make our mistakes and we compete and somebody wins and somebody loses. That's fine. Actually, there's nothing wrong with that. But we're growing and we, 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 we're going to get up there in the world, you know. Um, what... A, what happens is it becomes a clash of training methods, training techniques, and breeding. Everything comes together there on the field with you and your dog. Which is, which is the purpose of those trials, yeah. right? It, it comes right there. And um, you, you, you have to lay it down on the line. A lot of guys have a lot of talk. And then when it comes to going on the field, nothing. But I think it's improving and I think... They're, they're, you know, you're having dialogue, you're having conversations, and guys are starting to realize it's not so much a uh, uh, thing, it's just healthy competition and in a spirit of sportsmanship. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with this. Yeah. I, I have always, I think I, I told you that when 
you kind of pushed me into doing the BH with Ninja. That I have more respect for somebody showing up on that white line and tell the judge I'm ready and fails miserably. That's okay. Then somebody sitting in the stands always talking and never comes with a dog. The, one, the ones right? who sit in the stands, because they know the everything. Ones, the ones that show never, up, yeah. they didn't reach their vibe ups. Yeah. They would have done a certain amount of work with their dog and, and, and would have thought that they're ready. Turns out they may have not been, but that's okay. That's they okay. are there. They are putting it on display. Right? They're going there, stepping in front of somebody from another country, watching them, right? observing them as a judge, and start. Yeah. That takes a lot of courage. Takes a hell of a lot of courage. And somebody doing that, and maybe the dog has a bad day, the handler has a bad day. And, it happens. And, and a fail in exercise, that's okay. They will come back stronger. It happens. But, but those who only, they're experts and... and Self-professed experts that just talk all the time. Yeah. We, we have a saying that all the experts are sitting in the stands knowing what to do, what should have been done, what they would have done. Yeah. And they've never and they titled... have a friend that they, has a dog. They've never titled better. a dog. They've never titled a dog in their life. Uh, and if you ask them to show what they've done, what they've trained with a dog, they can't really show you. They could talk about something 20 years ago. and But have they put it to the test? Can they meet a certain standard can they do um basic obedience you know uh, unfortunately no however again credit to the guys that train go out there and make your mistakes don't be afraid because that is where you evolve and that's where you 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 become one with your dog and you, you you're not afraid to fail that is why you will succeed because the next time and the next time and the next time you're better and the experts still in the in the stands, what, year after year. What has helped me in, in, in that trial was the fact that the dog was working in detection way before that. Yes, he was a detection dog. Which gave me the confidence. Yes, I was nervous, but it gave me the confidence to do it and get the title. Because before that, the dog, I, I was working with the dog off leash in a car park searching cars with people walking around. Yes. Successfully. Which is basically a worse environment to be in with a lot more stress than a trial. Yeah. You know, but the trial was new to me at the time. So I'm glad I did it. So I want to thank you publicly. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was an eye opener for sure. And I've, I must have looked at that video of that trial a thousand times by now. And, of course, see any number of mistakes there that I would have made, yeah. you know. But, um, yeah, so let's let's wrap it up there. And we're going to do this again, definitely. Um, because we don't want to go two and three yeah. hours in, 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 in the podcast. We could, but it's, it, you know. Yeah. On, on the next occasion, maybe we can uh, use another interface and show actual details about how I would do a particular breeding, why I would have done a certain breeding, uh, because of the characteristics that come from certain dogs, certain bloodlines. Um, I, would, I, I have no problem in showing that. And um, yeah, I think yeah, it will be interesting and informative at the same time. I want to take a deep dive into German Shepherds. And um, yeah, definitely do it again and again and again. We're going <laughs> to do it. It gets so much to talk about. Yeah. With the with the wealth of, of knowledge yes. that, that you have. So we can't cover it in one. No, it's so, impossible. So we're gonna do this again and, and go deeper and deeper into this. So thank you very much yeah. and until next time. Again, Mark, thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure.